session this morning. Amen. Guide me through the word of the Lord. Let's open with prayer, could we? Praise Lord, we are so very thankful and grateful you have allowed us the opportunity to be in your house together. God, thank you for my brothers and my sisters that are here today. Every individual that will walk through the doors of the assembly. God, we pray that your hand would be touched, your arms of love and mercy and grace would be wrapped around every individual, Lord. Draw us closer to you in this place today. Let our praise and our worship build you a habitation. Fill this house, we pray. Uh, touch our minds and open our understanding, Lord. Let us receive the word of God as seed planted in good soil. In our hearts and minds today, let it grow and produce fruit and a harvest for the sake of the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. I, uh, I don't really have a, a text today for our lesson. Uh, I have a lot of scripture, and so we, we don't really have a, a text or a reading of a text, so we, we'll start. And uh, my, I was thinking this morning, and I, my mind kind of went to the story. Perhaps you've heard it. Uh, there were two farmers and they were talking one day and, and talking about uh, their, their Christian experience and what it meant to be a Christian. And they were talking, uh, the, the conversation evolved and, and got around to, uh, you know, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And so they, they began to explore that topic and finally one of them stopped and he looked at the other and he said, man, he said, if you had a million dollars, or he said, if you had $2 million, would you give me a million? He said, absolutely. He said, I would. He said, that's the Christian thing to do. That's, that's sharing. He, he thought about it a minute. He said, if you had two houses, he said, would you give me one? He said, absolutely, I would. He said, that, that'd be the right thing to do. He thought about that a moment, and he sounded, sounded good. And he said, well, he said, if you had two pigs, would you give me one? The other farmer looked at him and said, man, you know I got two pigs. <laughs> Some things are easy to talk about, but a little harder to do. Yeah, right. A little harder yeah. to practice in real life. Uh -huh. And uh, this is kind of one of those topics today that it's easy to talk about, a little harder to put into practice, yeah. a little harder to, to, yeah. to live out. But yeah. Yeah. if we will do it, if we will practice and exercise what we're going to talk about today, it will make life better and richer and a lot easier. Luke chapter 18 and verse number 8, the Bible, uh, Jesus is talking and he tells a story in Luke chapter 8. And he ends the parable and he says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus voices his concern with a rhetorical question, if you please. He, yeah. he wasn't looking for an answer. He was trying to make people think. Yeah. A rhetorical right. question is, is not one that you need to answer. It's one that, that's designed to make you think about the, the topic or the subject. Right. Amen. Jesus asked a rhetorical question. He says, when the Son of Man comes, when I come back again, when the second coming happens, will I find faith right. on the earth? Yeah. Amen. Will I find faith or will faith have been eradicated? Will it have been defeated? Will it have dwindled to the point of just accepting whatever comes? Yeah. Will faith be replaced by something that is less powerful but a lot easier to maintain? Will I find faith Faith. And his point being, from what I can tell, asking uh, that question and in that parable, uh, that faith, our faith, yeah. is to be guarded and to be maintained and to be yeah. exercised at all costs. Because yeah. faith is important. That's faith right. is, is necessary. Yes. I think it's important there also to know what he didn't say. Right. 
the entirety of that preceding story or chapter is about prayer. Right. And our topic today is is uh, is about trust. It's trust in the Lord. Trust right. in the Lord. Amen. Jesus tells that parable in Luke chapter eighteen, and it, it's about uh, it's about <coughs> prayer. It's about persistence. It's about not giving up. Yeah. The chapter begins with Doctor Luke. Uh, saying that Jesus spoke a parable saying that men right that's right. not talking about uh, males but humanity men ought always to pray and right. not faint right. right that pain is not pass out but it's uh, not give up right that's pray right. and yeah. not give up pray right. and don't quit somebody say don't quit don't, don't quit. quit don't quit and the widow in that story, who represents all of humanity, refuses to give up or to give in right. concerning her yeah. request and her petition. Right. She she comes to the unjust judge and she she knocks on his door every day and she continues to knock and, and he, he ignores her and she's back the next day and she's knocking yeah. on the door. She persists. She is consistent with her request and with yeah. her petition until he right. the unjust judge says I'm tired of this lady knocking on my door I'm going to give her what she wants because yeah. she's worrying me yeah. 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 Jesus' comparison is he says he instructs us there that God our heavenly father hears our prayers and hears our petitions yeah. and he sees our persistence and he will here's the good news he will Answer. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Persistence is not just an exercise in discipline. Persistence is a manifestation of our faith. Yeah, right. When we consistently pray and persistently pray and, and make it a daily thing to go yeah. to the throne Amen. of God, it is yeah. a manifestation yeah. of our faith. Amen. And Jesus right. says, Hey, when I come back, will I yeah. find faith on yeah. the earth? Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let me encourage us today, saying of God, keep praying, yeah. Yeah. keep seeking, keep knocking, yeah. keep pressing, yeah. keep reaching, keep yeah. asking. Yeah. It is a manifestation of your faith. Right. God's looking for faith. Yeah. God is moved by faith. God responds to faith. Yeah. Right. Keep yeah. praying for revival and keep yeah. praying for harvest and keep praying for prodigal. Yeah. Keep praying for miracles and keep praying for signs and yeah. wonders yeah. because those are the manifestation that, that gives the unsaved a revelation or right. an illumination of the things of God and that God is moving in His Amen. church. Yeah. Keep praying that the gifts of the Spirit will yes. operate Amen. in the assembly. Yes. Those are all things that the church needs to right. help reach this world. Amen. Amen. That's right. Let's pray consistently and persistently and, yes. and manifest our faith through our prayers. Watch, watch what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, Well, I find religious people. Right. Right. Jesus didn't say, Well, I find perfect people. Right. Well, I find people that just show up and go through the motions. No. He asked, will I find faith? Amen. Yeah. Will I find a faith that is demonstrated according to the context by persistent, consistent refusal to quit seeking and coming to the throne of God in prayer? Amen. Now, I, I told you we're talking about trust today. I didn't come to focus on prayer, but uh, while we're on the subject, sure. yeah. let's talk about it for a minute. Yes. Amen. Yes. Prayer is necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. Prayer is necessary. You are without a life of prayer. Yeah. Amen. Prayer is the womb of the Spirit. Yeah. Right. right. Amen. There are things that are conceived in prayer. Yeah that are manifest and born as a product of the Spirit. Right. Amen, that's you right. You want to see greater things? You want to see uh, the work of God? Prayer is the womb of the Spirit. Pray until 
in your spirit those things are conceived. Yeah. Prayer is the nurture of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's right. All of us married folks, how would married life be if you didn't communicate with your spouse? Right. No, it takes communication. Communication nurtures yeah. relationships. If you yeah. don't talk to your spouse, yeah. you have no relationship. That's if right. you don't talk to your children, you have no relationship. Right. If your children don't talk to you, you have no relationship. Right. Prayer is the nurture of relationship. You want to have a great relationship. You want to have a strong relationship. You want to have a good relationship with your Heavenly Father, with yeah. your Savior. Amen. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's right. Prayer is the battlefield of spiritual warfare. Yep. That's right. Prayer is where we receive the strength to fight the fight that we have to fight. Many years ago, and some of you may remember it, and I don't remember exactly where it come from, but I remember the prophetic utterance that went forth where God spoke to his church. And he said to his church, and this was back in probably the 60s or the 70s, uh, I, the first time I heard it, I remember Brother A.D. Spears from Longview, uh, Texas, uh, relating it. But God spoke to the church and said, you're in danger of getting to the place where you enjoy praise more than you enjoy prayer. Yeah. Yep. You'll praise a God that you no longer pray to. And that's unsettling because we're living in that day. Oh, yeah. Right. yeah. You can fill up an auditorium, you can fill up a stadium with a concert. Yeah. Yeah. But amen. call prayer meeting. Right. You're right. Yeah. Right. Well, amen. I'm right. stepping right. on my own toes today. <laughs> yeah. Amen. No, I believe that. And, and I didn't come here to step on our toes. I came to encourage us yes. to pray. Yes. Amen. Yeah. We. Church of the living God, God has given us a powerful, powerful tool in our tool belt, a powerful weapon in our arsenal, and that is simply to come to him in prayer. Somebody said that seven days without prayer makes one week, not W-E-E-K, but W-E-A. We need to pray. Amen. I remember... Uh, as a young man, somebody kind of coined the, the, the saying or the proverb or whatever you want to call it. Much prayer equals much power. Yeah. Little prayer equals little power. That's right. No prayer equals no power. Yep. <laughs> and that's a good philosophy to live yeah, by. Sure. If we can internalize that. Prayer doesn't have to be articulate. Prayer doesn't have to be long. Prayer doesn't have to be loud. Prayer doesn't have to be emotional. Prayer has to be done. Right. Amen. I used to think that prayer had to be this way. Oh, God, help us, Lord. God, we need you. Yeah. I came to the realization somewhere in life that God is a lot more concerned about the sincerity of prayer Absolutely. than he is the eloquence yeah. of prayer or the volume of yeah. prayer. Yeah. We talk about it. We teach yeah. about it. We have seminars and prayer conferences, but sometimes we struggle to do it. Amen. I just don't have time. Yeah. Amen. Corey Ten Boom, <clears throat> author and, and speaker, maybe a name that's familiar to you. She said, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Yeah, that's right. That yeah. seems to be the world that we live in today. Oh, know? yeah. I'm just too busy. Yeah. Yep. Church of the Living God. <clears throat> We have this thing called prayer. It is powerful. It is, uh, it is our strength. It is what will carry us forward in God. Right. Here, here's another rhetorical question. I'm asking this one. This one didn't come from the Bible, but just, uh, just to make you think. Do you have a prayer time? Don't, don't raise your hand. Do you have a prayer time? Okay, here's the rest of the question. Do you have a prayer time or do you have a prayer lot? Right. A lot of people have a prayer time. And that's a good thing. I, I'm not condemning that. But if I could just build on that, I don't just want a prayer time. I want a prayer lot. 
Yeah. God is where, where God is not far away, where there is constant conversation, where there is a building of relationship. Let, let me talk to you about three levels of prayer real quick, and, and we'll move on. We'll get off this subject. Everybody's good really, subject. really quiet today. It's a good subject. Amen. Prayer. We're talking about just for a moment about prayer. When, when you decide you're going to pray, most of us will decide that we're going to pray because we have a duty to pray. We yeah. have a responsibility to pray. We have a duty. And you will come to God and you will set a prayer time because you recognize that as a child of God, as a saint of God, as somebody that God has put his spirit into, that we have a duty to pray. Yeah. Whether you get up early in the morning or and pray, or whether your best prayer time is before you go to bed at night, you decide, I'm going to pray, I'm going to spend time with God. I have a duty yeah. to pray. Yeah, Amen. Amen. But after a while, that duty to pray is going to get old. Yeah. yeah. When you pray out of duty, it's going to get monotonous. It's going yeah. to... To, to you, there, you'll, you'll start finding other things to do and, and that's when you have to go to the next level of prayer and that is the discipline of prayer yeah. those of you Pastor John that's been in the military you know, the prayer wears off that's when the sense of discipline has to kick in yeah Amen. Right. I know I don't feel like it. I know I may not be seeing any result from it right now, and I've got a million other things that I need to do, but I will discipline myself to yeah. go to the throne of God. I will discipline myself to go to my prayer closet. I will discipline myself to go to my war room yeah. because I must pray, and it's beyond the duty of prayer. It is the discipline of prayer. Amen. That's right. Oh, but friend of mine, can I tell you that there is another level of prayer. That's right. If you will exercise the duty of prayer, and if you will exercise the discipline of prayer, there is a level that we call the delight of prayer. Amen. And when you pray yourself through the duty, and you pray yourself through the discipline, you will enter into a realm of of delight when you pray to the point where when you miss a day of talking to God there is something there's an empty yeah. hole in your spirit that says hey I gotta find a place to pray yeah. I've gotta talk to God I gotta get in the presence of right. the Lord Amen. I've gotta spend some time with my Amen. Lord Amen. the right. discipline is, is it's not what it requires anymore it's a delight it's like somebody that you are in love with that yeah. you can't wait to be in their presence. Amen. You like to hang around them. It's always fun and a good time. It is the delight of prayer. Amen. 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 Right. First Thessalonians 5 tells us to pray without ceasing. Right. Ephesians 6 and 18 commands us praying always. Luke 18 and 1. Men must always pray and not faint. Amen. Child of God, let me remind us today that God actually hears your prayer. He does. And God answers your prayer. Yes, he does. Amen. Acts chapter 10, a Roman centurion soldier by the name of Cornelius. The Bible said that he prayed and gave until his prayer built a memorial. Mm -hmm. A monument, if you please. Yeah. The Greek word means remembrance. He built something that, that brought his petition as a remembrance before God. Yeah. yeah. You've seen it, I've seen it. Certain places there are memorials, there are walls, there are statues that cause us to remember uh, people or peoples worthy of honor and respect. They're granite uh, walls with thousands of names carved into them, memorializing soldiers and veterans, those who gave all. Yeah. Everybody's probably aware in Washington, D.C., there's a memorial wall that was built and completed in 1982. It has nearly 60,000 names inscribed on that wall of soldiers either confirmed dead or missing. Yeah. The monument receives about 3 million visitors every year. It is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. 
And you can go online and you can read the comments and the reflections of the men and women who have visited this memorial wall in Washington, D.C. And they'll leave comments with words like life-changing, yeah. impactful. Yeah. I can never forget. It was awe-inspiring. I saw comments like, I wept, I cried, I, I stood in silent reverence. That's the power of a memorial. That's right. Do you understand that what God is trying to tell us when he tells us the story about Cornelius? We have need to realize that, that that's what consistent persistence, faithful prayer does before God. Amen. It builds a memorial. Cornelius, with his prayer and alms, built a memorial, a thing of remembrance before yeah. God. What does that mean? Everywhere that God turned, there was this thing that said, every, everywhere he turned, he, he bumped into this memorial that said, hey, uh, Cornelius, Cornelius is seeking you. Yeah. Cornelius is praying. Cornelius is reaching you. Yeah, that's right. It was a manifestation of faith yeah. for Cornelius. That's right. Amen. When you pray in faith, it gets God's attention. Yeah. When you build a war room, when you expand your prayer closet, when you develop a prayer lot. Yeah. yeah. Amen. What in the world does all of that have to do with trust? I'm, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. I'm we, we need faith. God is looking for faith. Right. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us without faith it is difficult. No it's impossible, impossible to please God. Yeah. Jesus' prayer for Peter and the rest of the disciples, and, and by extension us, uh, was not that we would not fail, but that our faith, faith would right. not fail. Right. That's right. Right. Faith seems to be important. Yeah. What is faith? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and we'll spend the rest of our life I'm trying to unravel that phrase from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1. Yeah, yeah. Faith, but, but here's what we do know. A thorough study of the scriptures reveals to us that faith is a very multifaceted concept. It has a lot of components. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, it's yeah. not just a simple thing. James, sure. in James chapter 2, James says, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Yeah. Yeah. Faith is more than just a thinking word. Right. Faith is a verb. It's an action word. My actions show or manifest my faith. Yeah, that's right. Amen. How do I express my faith? By the things I do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Amen. A constant theme in the Bible is faithfulness. Yeah. Faithfulness is a component of faith. To the Hebrew mind, there was no separation between faith and faithfulness. Right. They right. were synonymous Amen. terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. If you're 95% faithful to your spouse, <laughs> you aren't really faithful at all. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Faithfulness mm -hmm. is a is a component of faith. Remember. Naaman, the story about Naaman in the Old Testament? Sure. Amen. It wasn't Naaman's belief. That's right. It wasn't that his belief was so high. Right. In fact, Naaman's initial response was frustration. Oh, yeah. Hey, I've got leprosy. Yep. Man of God, prophet of God, what do I need to do? Go wash in Jordan seven times. Mm. He turned around and was mad about it. Yeah. Yeah. The Jordan's nasty. It's filthy. That's a nasty river. Why do I want to do that? Man, there, there are rivers in my own country that are beautiful and clear and pristine. Can I go wash in them? He was frustrated. He was mad. He yeah. thought the man of God should have just said magic words and waved his hands on him, laid hands on him, and everything would have been all right. But he gave him a task to do that challenged his ability to yeah. obey. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But ultimately, with a little encouragement, Naaman did respond with obedience and went and washed in the Jordan River and God responded with a complete healing and restoration. Amen. Obedience is a component and a manifestation of faith. 
if you can imagine faith as a cake. Yeah. Some of you ladies and maybe men too like to bake. I I love Italian cream cake. Amen. There are over twenty uh, ingredients in Italian cream cake. Some of, some of them you wouldn't think about eating by themselves. Yeah. Every component of faith is not pleasant or enjoyable. But when you mix all of those ingredients together, man, they produce something that is yeah. wonderful. When you when you mix all those ingredients together, when you when you put everything in the right amounts right. together, yeah. there, there is something that is powerful, something that is great. To, when we mix all of those components of faith together. So here we are. I yeah. said all that to say this. Yeah. Trust is an ingredient of our faith. That's right, amen. If you examine the cake of faith, you're going to always find the ingredient of trust. Yes, God wants us to obey Him. You have to obey the gospel, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a component to, that is us obeying the gospel. God wants us to be faithful to Him, to work for Him, to Amen. serve Him, yeah. Amen. and to trust Him. Yes, Amen. You know what's so awesome and wonderful about God's plan? All of these things benefit the kingdom of God. Right. That, that's for sure. Yep. But they lead us to the blessings of God as well. Amen. God has designed all of these things not just to benefit his kingdom, but to bless us. That's right. Let's, let's talk about trust here for just a little bit. What is trust? Miriam Webster says that trust is a firm belief in the reliability and the character and the ability and the strength or truth of someone or something. Yeah. And in our case today, we're talking about God. Our, our trust in God would be a firm belief in His reliability and His character and His strength and ability or the truth of who He is and what He is. Yeah, amen. Right. Now, we, we, we need to be careful when we talk about trust and make sure we aren't putting our trust in the wrong thing in the yeah. wrong place yeah. make sure we aren't misplacing our trust yeah in september of 1941 september the 6th of 1941 there was a journalist by the name of clark beach that wrote an article and in his article he, he wrote these words and i quote he said a japanese attack on Hawaii is regarded as the most unlikely thing in the world. Yeah. He said, with one chance in a million of being successful, besides having more powerful defenses than any other post under the American flag, it's protected by distance. Yeah. Almost three months later to the date, yeah. over 3,000 dead or wounded. Yeah. Yep. You trust in him. Yeah. Jeremiah 17 and 5, the word of God says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now, God's not pronouncing a curse on anybody. He's yeah. saying by your actions, you've yeah. already cursed yourself. Yeah. Right. When you turn away from God, when you trust your own ability and your own yeah. intellect yeah, and your right. own strength and yeah. your yeah. own power, and you leave God out of the question, friend of mine, you've already set yourself up for failure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Amen. Absolutely. That's right. What are you trying to say, Brother Moody? Be careful what you trust in. Talking this morning about trust. Where do you place your trust? What is your trust in? Psalm uh, 37, verses 1 through 5. Psalm, Psalm 37, if you have a Bible, hopefully Brother Roland can and get it on the screen there. Very good. The Bible says, the psalmist writes, he says, Do not fret. Yeah. And that's a word we don't use a whole lot, is it? Yeah. It, it, it brings to mind emotion. Uh, anger, passion, 
grief. Don't fret. When somebody frets, they've gotten themselves all worked up. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen anybody that, that just gets themselves worked up, usually yeah. over not not anything that's worth getting perked up about. Yeah. But yeah. You, your emotion and your passion and your, your anger or your frustration, man, it gets you all worked up. But the psalmist says, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, God tells us, do not fret. Right. Yeah. Why? Don't fret because of those who are evil or be envious. There's that emotion again, excited or provoked yeah. of those who do wrong. Yeah. And God declares what happens to them. He says, for like the grass. I don't know about your grass at your house in the middle of August in Texas, but mine's all brown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like the grass, they will wither like green plants. They will soon die away. Yeah. And yeah. this is what the people of God keep doing what's right. Yeah. Yeah. Dwell yeah. in the land and enjoy safe pastures. King James Version says it a little bit different. says, Thou shalt be be yeah. what, what, watch, watch this. This is, uh, this is God speaking to us. He says, take delight in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. If you're delighted in the things of God, if your yeah. heart is set on the things yeah. of God, then God wants to give you the desires of your heart. Yeah. If you want what God wants, if your mind is set on having the things of God, God wants to give you your heart's desire. Yeah. Commit your way to the Lord. Yeah. Here it is again. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Yeah. God through the pen of the psalmist and the prophet of God. David was both a, a psalmist and a prophet. God gives you and I some very, very clear direction and instruction, doesn't he? He says, don't worry, don't fear, don't yeah. fret. Yeah. Don't get all worked up emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. right. I told you this was easy to talk about and hard to do, right? Oh, yeah. Don't, don't get all worked up. Don't, don't, don't fret. Trust in the Lord. Yeah. Trust in the Lord. Yeah. Yep. He says, take delight. First, trust in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. That means to, to be happy or to be excited or to be delighted. Well, I don't feel delighted. Well, it's not really a feeling. It's a choice. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I, I'm, I'm excited about the things of God because I decided I'm going to be excited about yeah. the things of God. Yeah. Right. I got up at 5 o'clock this morning. Why? Because I needed to prepare uh, and, and pray and talk to God about the things that were going to transpire today. Yeah. Amen. Do I like getting up really early in the morning? No. But I decided, hey, this is something, this is, I, I want God's desire to be the desires of my heart. Yeah. I'm going to be excited about the things of Amen. God. Yes. I get to go to my happy place today. Yeah. Amen. Amen. It's a choice. It's a decision that we make. And commit to, to the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord and commit to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's right. The Hebrew word there is galel. It means to roll away. Commit is galel in the Hebrew. And it means to roll away. Yeah. You now, how in the world did they get commit out of roll away? It, it is, it literally means to take the burdens and the pressure yeah. and the stress and the worry and the anxiety and the fear that life lays on my shoulders. Yeah. 
I have the responsibility of, of carrying all of this. But God says, I tell you what, if you will commit to me, yeah. if you will take all of this and roll it off of your shoulders yeah. and roll yeah. it on to mine. Yeah. Right. The law is uh, in the Hebrew imperative sense. That means it is a command. What are you saying, Brother Moody? I'm telling you that God has commanded you to take the fear and the anxiety and the stress and the worry and commit it to Him, roll it on to Him. Amen. Amen. Right. That is trust. Yeah. God, I'm tired of carrying this. God, yeah. I don't have the ability to carry this. I don't have the intellect to figure it out. And God, your heavenly yeah. Father says, well, that's good because I never intended for you to have to carry it yeah. and worry about it and figure it out. Roll it onto my shoulders. I have the ability yeah. and the wisdom and the intellect to help yeah. you and to carry that for you. Amen. That's wow. Right. Yeah. Isn't the word of God beautiful? God God says, trust in me. What does that mean? That means God wants to carry your burdens. Yeah, amen. God That's never right. asked us to figure it out. He yeah. asked us to trust in him, and he's already figured it out. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he does. Right. Here's a restaurant in uh, Madison, Mississippi. My wife and I used to eat there when we were at home. It's called Mama Hamill. That name right there doesn't tell you it's got to be some good food. Then uh, it's a, it's good uh, home cooking. Yeah. And uh, I, they used to, I don't know if they still do, they used to have a sign on the register when you walked in and you, you paid, it's a buffet style, and you paid, there's a big sign there. And the sign said, I'm God. And I will be taking care of your problems today. And I won't be needing your help. Do you know God has the ability to do that? Yeah. The problem is we like to help him, don't we? Yeah. Oh yeah. But if we will just trust him, right. trust God to take care of our needs. See, yeah. I told you it's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do. Amen. Oh, yeah. God will give you impossible tasks. God will put you in impossible situations. God will let you face impossible giants yeah. so that you don't have a choice but to trust in Him. That's right. That's right. Yeah. When David came before Goliath, he, he, went, he went down to the brook and he picked up his stones. He sure did. He carried his sling, but when he stood before Goliath, he said, let me tell you something. Now, you come to me with a sword and a shield, but I didn't come to you with just these stones and a sling. I came to you in the name of the Lord. I'm not trusting in a few rocks, and I'm not trusting in my ability to, to, to be accurate with this sling. But what I know is that there is a God that is well able to deliver you into my Yes, Amen. Amen. Good teaching. Stop worrying. Stop fretting. Stop fearing. Stop being anxious. Yeah. Amen. Because you've given all those things to Him. That's right. Amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six. One of my favorite passages of Scripture. I try to quote it almost daily. I, 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 I this is a passage of Scripture that I pray because I think it is. So very powerful, and you all know it and, and can quote it. Yeah. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Trust. And trust is hard to do. We don't live in a world that's very conducive to trusting, do we? I was going to ask for a show of hands, but I probably, if I did, it'd be unanimous. Is there anybody in this place that's ever had their trust betrayed? No, no. We could probably all say, oh, oh, yes, oh, yes. Yeah. We don't live in a world that's conducive to uh, just a uh, uh, free trust. I just trust everybody. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. No, because people, they, there are people out there that want to take advantage of us. There are people out there that want to abuse us. There are people out there that want to hurt us uh, for their own good. 
And so trust is not always easy, but it is so necessary when it comes to the things of God. Amen. 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 We have to trust in the Lord. Amen. And I don't know about you, if I could be transparent on a Sunday morning, I would tell you that Brother Moody likes to have a little bit in reserve. <laughs> yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, 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 I trust you this much. I, I, somebody said I don't trust them as far as I can see them. That means as long as they're standing there looking at me, I, I can trust them. But once they get out of sight, I, that's a whole different story. I've got some in reserve in the matter of trust. But the Bible instructs us, the Word of God tells us yeah. that not only should we, but we can trust yeah. God Absolutely. with all of our heart, Amen. with Amen. the completeness and entirety of our yeah. being. You can put all of your trust in Him. Amen. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Right. You can put all yeah. of your trust in Him. Yes, Don't hold anything in reserve and do not lean on your own understanding. Right? That's right, amen. <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. Yeah. I, I, I got this all figured out. I prayed about it, but I took it back. I yeah. said, Lord, help me with this, but then I thought about it, and I, I said, well, this is the way it's going to work, and so I took it back. But God warns us. He said, don't lean on your own understanding. You, you, there are some things that in this world that, that God has a little more insight into right. than I do. Right. I had, had a pastor friend, pastored in Dangerfield, Texas. <clears throat> he had a youth pastor that uh, invited a young man to preach a youth rally. And the young man had been involved in some things that he shouldn't have been involved in. But the youth pastor didn't know it and he invited him, uh, Bishop, and <coughs> had him come preach. <coughs> So my pastor friend had to call his youth pastor in and say, look, the next time you get ready to invite someone, would you please, uh, he wasn't mad, he wasn't angry, just instruction, if you don't mind, run it by me. He said, I, I may be privy to a little information that you're not privy to. Yeah. Sometimes God is privy to some things oh. down the road yeah. that we're not privy oh, to, yeah. that we in our limited vision and our limited intellect can't see but if we will trust in him he takes into account Amen. the things that are down the road and he prepares us and he uh, well, well I don't know why God isn't answering my prayer because answering your prayer may hinder some things down the road because you in your current situation and he may be preparing you and yeah. positioning you for something greater down the road Amen. trust That's in right. the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean to your own understanding yeah. because your own understanding is flawed and limited. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Amen. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. That's right. Amen. Not single path, but paths, plural. Every path of your life, God has the ability to direct. Amen. He can direct your family path. He can direct your career path. Yes. He can. Uh, he can direct every path in your life if you will yeah. acknowledge him yeah. and trust yeah. in him yeah. with those things amen we're talking about trust yes. trust Robert Sutton he is an author and a professor at Stanford University he writes this he said a television program preceding the 1988 Winter Olympics featured blind skiers being trained for slalom skiing. Okay, did you catch what I said? Blind skiers being trained for slalom snow skiing. Impossible as that sounds, here's how they did it. They paired them with sighted skiers. The blind skiers were taught on the flats how to make right turns and left turns and when that was mastered they were taken to the slalom slope where their sighted partners skied beside them and shouted left and right and left and right and they obeyed the commands 
And as they did so, they were able to negotiate the course and cross the finish line, depending solely on the sighted skier's word. Right. Amen. Depending on the sighted skier's word and their ability to trust that word and obey that word, it was either complete success or complete catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. What, a, what a vivid picture of, of the Christian life. In this world, we are, in reality, blind sometimes about what course to take, what decisions to make. We, we have to rely on the word of the only one that truly has inside and sight, and that's right. God. Amen. Amen. His word gives us the direction that we need to finish uh, the course. Amen. Right. The word trust is used over 150 times in the King James Version. From the Song of David recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 22, after all that David went through, after all of the giants that he faced, after all of the, the lions and the bears and the wicked kings and the re rebellious kids and the hateful and hate-filled enemies, the struggles and the, the wilderness, the grief, the loss. Here is David's declaration and his conclusion. 2 Samuel 22 and 3, David says, The God of my rock, in him will I trust. Yes. He's my shield and save me from violence. Amen. 2 Samuel 22 and 31 still what we call David's song and he's still talking about the salvation and the deliverance of God. He says, as for God, his way is perfect. Amen. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust Amen. in him. Amen. You know what the difference between a shield and a buckler is? In, in, in ancient times, at times, a shield was a very large instrument. It was used by armies as they went into battle to shield a, not just themselves, but a multitude of, of arrows shot and spears thrown, a, a, a large uh, six or seven foot tall, three or four foot wide, it was a shield. But a buckler was something that was worn on the wrist or the forearm, and it was used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. It was used up close and personal. David was saying, hey, if you will trust in the Lord, he will be your shield and your buckler. He will be your buckler. When, when it seems like the enemy and the adversary has brought some up close and personal battles, you can trust that God's going to be Amen. your buckler. Amen. Amen. The enemy's going to try to destroy you with deceit and lies and confusion and slander and fear and doubt and misunderstanding. But Lord, I trust you to be my buckler. Amen. Amen. First Chronicles 5 and 20, and they were helped against them and the Hagarites and, and delivered them into their hands. This is talking about the Reubenites when they were fighting against and taking territory and all that were with them. Yeah. For they cried to God in the battle, and he was entreated of them because they were great, because they were mighty, because they were strong, because they were skilled in battle. No, because they put their trust in, the in him. That's right. Friend of mine, they conquered and they were victorious, not because they were something great, but the word of God says that they were victorious because God all acted on their behalf when they trusted in right. him. Right. Amen. 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 So many scriptures, so many scriptures. Amen. Proverbs 28 and 25, he that is of a proud heart stirreth up strife, but he that putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made fat. That's not talking about size. That's talking about increased and blessed and enlarged. Amen. God wants to bless you. God wants yeah. to increase you. Put your trust in the Lord. Isaiah 26 and 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Friend of mine, if you need strength for the journey, trust in the Lord. Yeah. God Amen. is your strength. Amen. 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 Stand with me if you will. I'm coming to a close.
Dave and Helen Ellis. You probably don't know the name. Dave and Helen Ellis had a young daughter, their, their baby daughter. Her name was Joanne. She had contracted hepatitis. This was back in the 1950s. Joanne was the baby of the family. She was the apple of her father's eye. She was a brilliant student with a very bright future. She was an honor student in the valedictorian of her Evanston, Indiana high school class. Things didn't look too good today one morning as he started to work. The family physician, Dr. Cummins, had advised the Ellis's that Joanne was a very, very sick young lady. And he recommended that she go and visit a specialist. He recommended a specialist by the name of Dr. Kaiser. He called him in. Dave went on to work and Mama Helen took care of Joanne. And that evening, a very weary Dave Ellis, not only from the task of the day at work and the burden of his daughter's sickness on his mind, he returned home from, from a long day at the office and he walked through the door. His wife, Helen, rushed to him. She threw her arms around her husband and delightfully reported, Dave, the specialist has examined Joanne and Dr. Cummins really trusts Dr. Kaiser and, and Dr. Kaiser's opinion is, 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 is that she's going to be all right. And, and Dr. Cummins, our, our GP, says that she's in good hands with Dr. Kaiser. She's yeah. going to be okay. Yeah. That lifted everybody's spirits and life went on and Joanne got better. A few months later, Dave was a part of a focus group at work trying to develop an ad program for the following year. And there were ad agency representatives and company executives all together in this big room. And they were trying to come up with something. They, they were trying to get the creative juices stirring, something that would really encapsulate their company's mission and goals. Ideas were presented and none seemed to get the unanimous approval that they all wanted. And, and finally, Dave remembered his wife's words concerning his daughter's doctor. He remembered the comfort that he felt. He remembered the peace of mind it evoked when he heard his wife utter those words, Joanne's in good hands. They suggested those words as a slogan, and you're already ahead of me here today, with a pair of hands cradling a home and an automobile. You see, Dave works for Allstate Insurance Company, and by that event, that became the slogan that has stood, that has stood with Allstate all of these years, you're in good hands. And the rest is history, so to speak. Even today, polls indicate that that slogan, you're in good hands, is one of the most recognized slogans in the world today. Yep. All states saying, hey, you can trust us. We're going to take care of you. Can I tell you today, child of God, you're in good hands. If your trust is in the Lord, right. you're in good yeah. hands. Yeah. If you trust him with all of your heart, you're in good hands. Well, it doesn't look like things are very good. Trust him, you're in good hands. Yeah. It right. doesn't look like things are going my way. Trust him, you're in good hands. Right. Amen. It doesn't look like it's going to work out all right. Trust him, you're in good hands. That's right. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful for the, for the, the testimonies and the reports lately of the people that yeah. this church and this assembly has prayed for, that God has come, hey, you're in good hands. Amen. Lord, we are so grateful and thankful for your word that strengthens us and encourages us today. Remind us once again in our spirit that we're in good hands with you. God, help us in our hearts to trust in you when we don't understand, when we can't figure it out, when we can't make sense of it, when we're confused, when the world doesn't look like all is going well, help us to remember that we're in good hands. 
Job said in your word, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Lord, let my spirit and my attitude be that of Job. I may not understand it. It may look horrible and bad, but I'm going to trust in you because I know at the end of the day, you're God and you're still on the throne and you're still in charge of my world and everything. I trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed.